Lesson 10 The New Covenant Sabbath Afternoon May 29 Love is the principle that underlies God's government in heaven and on earth, and this love must be interwoven in the life of the Christian. The love of Christ is not a fitful love. It is deep and broad and full. Its possessor will not say, I will love only those who love me. The heart that is influenced by this holy principle will be carried above everything of a selfish nature. The religion of Jesus Christ is not merely to prepare us for the future immortal life. It is to enable us to live the Christ life here on earth. Jesus is not only our pattern, he is also our friend and our guide. And by taking hold of his strong arm and partaking of his spirit, we may walk even as he walked. That I may know him, page 298. If the Abrahamic covenant contained the promise of redemption, why was another covenant formed at Sinai? In their bondage, the people had to a great extent lost the knowledge of God and of the principles of the Abrahamic covenant. In delivering them from Egypt, God sought to reveal to them his power and his mercy that they might be led to love and trust him. He brought them down to the Red Sea, where pursued by the Egyptians, escape seemed impossible, that they might realize their utter helplessness, their need of divine aid and then he wrought deliverance for them. Thus they were filled with love and gratitude to God and with confidence in his power to help them. He had bound them to himself as their deliverer from temporal bondage. But there was still a greater truth to be impressed upon their minds. Living in the midst of idolatry and corruption, they had no true conception of the holiness of God, of the exceeding sinfulness of their own hearts, their utter inability in themselves to render obedience to God's law, and their need of a Savior. All this they must be taught. Patriarchs and Prophets, page 371. The Apostle Paul clearly presents the relation between faith and the law under the New Covenant. He says, Being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Do we then make void the law through faith? God forbid. Yea, we establish the law. For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, it could not justify man because in his sinful nature he could not keep the law, God sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin condemned sin in the flesh, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Romans chapter 5, verse 1, chapter 3, verse 31, and chapter 8, verses 3 and 4. Patriarchs and Prophets, page 373. Sunday, May 30. Behold, the days are coming. God's work is the same in all time, although there are different degrees of development and different manifestations of His power to meet the wants of men in the different ages. Beginning with the first gospel promise and coming down through the patriarchal and Jewish ages, and even to the present time, there has been a gradual unfolding of the purposes of God in the plan of redemption. The Savior, typified in the rites and ceremonies of the Jewish law, is the very same that is revealed in the Gospel. The clouds that enveloped His divine form have rolled back, the mists and shades have disappeared, and Jesus, the world's Redeemer, stands revealed. He who proclaimed the law from Sinai and delivered to Moses the precepts of the ritual law is the same that spoke the Sermon on the Mount. The great principles of love to God which he set forth as the foundation of the law and the prophets are only a reiteration of what he had spoken through Moses to the Hebrew people. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy might. Deuteronomy chapter 6 verses 4 and 5. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Leviticus chapter 19 verse 18. The teacher is the same in both dispensations. God's claims are the same. The principles of his government are the same. 
for all proceed from him with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. James chapter 1, verse 17. Patriarchs and Prophets, page 373. Where there is not only a belief in God's word, but a submission of the will to him, where the heart is yielded to him, the affections fixed upon him, there is faith, faith that works by love and purifies the soul. Through this faith, the heart is renewed in the image of God, and the heart that in its unrenewed state is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be, now delights in its holy precepts, exclaiming with the psalmist, Oh, how love I thy law! It is my meditation all the day. Psalm 119, verse 97. And the righteousness of the law is fulfilled in us, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Romans chapter 8, verse 1. God's Amazing Grace, page 137. The Jews had misinterpreted God's promise of eternal favor to Israel. The Jews regarded their natural descent from Abraham as giving them a claim to his favor. But they overlooked the conditions which God had specified. Before giving the promise, he had said, I will put my law in their inward parts and write it in their hearts and will be their God and they shall be my people. For I will forgive their iniquity and I will remember their sin no more. Jeremiah chapter 31, verses 33 and 34. The Desire of Ages, page 106. Monday, May 31. Heart Work. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their mind and write them in their hearts, and I will be to them a God and they shall be to me a people. Hebrews chapter 8, verse 10. The blessings of the new covenant are grounded purely on mercy in forgiving unrighteousness and sins. The Lord specifies, I will do thus and thus unto all who turn to me, forsaking the evil and choosing the good. I will be merciful to their unrighteousness, and their sins and their iniquities will I remember no more. Hebrews chapter 8, verse 12. All who humble their hearts, confessing their sins, will find mercy and grace and assurance. That I may know him, page 299. The same law that was engraved upon the tables of stone is written by the Holy Spirit upon the tables of the heart. Instead of going about to establish our own righteousness, we accept the righteousness of Christ. His blood atones for our sins. His obedience is accepted for us. Then the heart renewed by the Holy Spirit will bring forth the fruits of the Spirit. Through the grace of Christ we shall live in obedience to the law of God written upon our hearts. Having the Spirit of Christ, we shall walk even as He walked. Through the prophet He declared of Himself, I delight to do Thy will, O my God, yea, Thy law is within my heart. Psalm 40, verse 8. And when among men He said, The Father hath not left me alone. For I do always those things that please him. John chapter 8, verse 29. Patriarchs and Prophets, page 372. To a people in whose hearts his law is written, the favor of God is assured. They are one with him. But the Jews had separated themselves from God. Because of their sins, they were suffering under his judgments. This was the cause of their bondage to a heathen nation. Their minds were darkened by transgression, and because in times past the Lord had shown them so great favor, they excused their sins. They flattered themselves that they were better than other men, and entitled to his blessings. These things are written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 11. How often we misinterpret God's blessings and flatter ourselves that we are favored on account of some goodness in us. God cannot do for us that which he longs to do. His gifts are used to increase our self-satisfaction and to harden our hearts in unbelief and sin. The Desire of Ages, page 106. 
The danger that lies before those living in these last days is the absence of pure religion, the absence of heart holiness. The converting power of God has not wrought in transforming their characters. They profess to believe sacred truths as did the Jewish nation, but in their failing to practice the truth, they are ignorant both of the scriptures and the power of God. The power and influence of God's law are around about, but not within the soul, renewing it in true holiness. This Day with God, page 146. Tuesday, June 1. Old and New Covenants Though the covenant was made with Adam and renewed to Abraham, it could not be ratified until the death of Christ. It had existed by the promise of God since the first intimation of redemption had been given. It had been accepted by faith. Yet when ratified by Christ, it is called a new covenant. The law of God was the basis of this covenant, which was simply an arrangement for bringing men again into harmony with the divine will, placing them where they could obey God's law. Another compact, called in Scripture the Old Covenant, was formed between God and Israel at Sinai and was then ratified by the blood of a sacrifice. The Abrahamic covenant was ratified by the blood of Christ, and it is called the Second or New Covenant, because the blood by which it was sealed was shed after the blood of the First Covenant. That the New Covenant was valid in the days of Abraham is evident from the fact that it was then confirmed both by the promise and by the oath of God, the two immutable things in which it was impossible for God to lie. Hebrews chapter 6, verse 18. Patriarchs and Prophets, pages 370 and 371. The Savior had not come to set aside what patriarchs and prophets had spoken, for He Himself had spoken through these representative men. All the truths of God's Word came from Him, but these priceless gems had been placed in false settings. Their precious light had been made to minister to error. God desired them to be removed from their settings of error and replaced in the framework of truth. This work only a divine hand could accomplish. By its connection with error, the truth had been serving the cause of the enemy of God and man. Christ had come to place it where it would glorify God and work the salvation of humanity. The Desire of Ages, page 287. Paul likens the remnant in Israel to a noble olive tree, some of whose branches have been broken off. He compares the Gentiles to branches from a wild olive tree grafted into the parent stock. Through unbelief and the rejection of heaven's purpose for her, Israel as a nation had lost her connection with God. But the branches that had been separated from the parent stock, God was able to reunite with the true stock of Israel, the remnant who had remained true to the God of their fathers. They also, the apostle declares of these broken branches, if they abide not still in unbelief, shall be grafted in, for God is able to graft them in again. If thou, he writes to the Gentiles, wert cut out of the olive tree which is wild by nature, and wert grafted contrary to nature into a good olive tree, how much more shall these, which be the natural branches, be grafted into their own olive tree? For I would not, brethren, that ye should be ignorant of this mystery, lest ye should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part is happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. The Acts of the Apostles, page 377 Wednesday, June 2 A Better Covenant to believe in Christ merely as the Savior of the world can never bring healing to the soul. The faith that is unto salvation is not a mere assent to the truth of the gospel. True faith is that which receives Christ as a personal Savior. God gave His only begotten Son that I, by believing in Him, should not perish but have everlasting life. John chapter 3, verse 16. When I come to Christ, According to His Word, I am to believe that I receive His saving grace. The life that I now live, I am to live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave Himself for me. Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. Many hold faith as an opinion. 
Saving faith is a transaction by which those who receive Christ join themselves in covenant relation with God. A living faith means an increase of vigor, a confiding trust by which, through the grace of Christ, the soul becomes a conquering power. The Ministry of Healing, page 62. Let us be hopeful and courageous. God knows our every necessity. To the omnipotence of the King of Kings, our covenant-keeping God unites the gentleness and care of the tender shepherd. His power is absolute, and it is the pledge of the sure fulfillment of His promises to all who trust in Him. He has means for the removal of every difficulty that those who serve Him and respect the means He employs may be sustained. His love is as far above all other love as the heavens are above the earth. He watches over His children with a love that is measureless and everlasting. In the darkest days, when appearances seem most forbidding, have faith in God. He is working out His will, doing all things well in behalf of His people. The strength of those who love and serve Him will be renewed day by day. He is able and willing to bestow upon His servants all the help they need. He will give them the wisdom which their varied necessities demand. The Ministry of Healing, pages 481 and 482. And as they were eating, Jesus took bread and blessed it, and break it, and gave it to the disciples, and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And he took the cup, and gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying, Drink ye all of it, for this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. In partaking with his disciples of the bread and wine, Christ pledged himself to them as their Redeemer. He committed to them the new covenant by which all who receive him become children of God and joint heirs with Christ. By this covenant, every blessing that heaven could bestow for this life and the life to come was theirs. This covenant deed was to be ratified with the blood of Christ, and the administration of the sacrament was to keep before the disciples the infinite sacrifice made for each of them individually as a part of the great whole of fallen humanity. The Desire of Ages, pages 653 and 656. Thursday, June 3. The New Covenant Priest in his teachings, Christ showed how far-reaching are the principles of the law spoken from Sinai. He made a living application of that law whose principles remain forever the great standard of righteousness, the standard by which all shall be judged in that great day when the judgment shall sit and the books shall be opened. He came to fulfill all righteousness and as the head of humanity to show man that he can do the same work meeting every specification of the requirements of God. Through the measure of His grace furnished to the human agent, not one need miss heaven. Perfection of character is attainable by everyone who strives for it. This is made the very foundation of the new covenant of the gospel. The law of Jehovah is the tree. The gospel is the fragrant blossoms and fruit which it bears. Selected Messages, Book 1, page 211 Christ himself was the originator of the Jewish system of worship in which by types and symbols were shadowed forth spiritual and heavenly things. Many forgot the true significance of these offerings, and the great truth that through Christ alone there is forgiveness of sin was lost to them. The multiplying of sacrificial offerings, the blood of bulls and goats, could not take away sin. A lesson was embodied in every sacrifice, impressed in every ceremony, solemnly preached by the priest in his holy office, and inculcated by God himself, that through the blood of Christ alone is their forgiveness of sins. How little we as a people feel the force of this great truth! How seldom, by living, acting faith, do we bring into our lives this great truth that there is forgiveness for the least sin, forgiveness for the greatest sin. 
the atonement of Christ sealed forever the everlasting covenant of grace. It was the fulfilling of every condition upon which God suspended the free communication of grace to the human family. Every barrier was then broken down which intercepted the freest exercise of grace, mercy, peace, and love to the most guilty of Adam's race. Ellen G. White comments in the SDA Bible Commentary, Volume 7, page 933. As Jesus died on Calvary, he cried, It is finished. And the veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom. This was to show that the services of the earthly sanctuary were forever finished and that God would no more meet with the priests in their earthly temple to accept their sacrifices. The blood of Jesus was then shed, which was to be offered by himself in the heavenly sanctuary. Early Writings, page 253. The infinite sufficiency of Christ is demonstrated by his bearing the sins of the whole world. He occupies the double position of offerer and of offering, of priest and of victim. He was holy, harmless, undefiled, and separate from sinners. The prince of this world cometh, he declares, and hath nothing in me. John chapter 14, verse 30. He was a lamb without blemish and without spot. Letter 192, June 8, 1906. For further reading, My Life Today, Reverence for God's Name, page 282, and This Day with God, Heart Holiness, page 146.